we are talking about predestination. Predestination is a subject uh, that comes up in the Bible, and the Bible tells us many times, uh, uh, particularly in the New, New Testament, that God had preordained or predestined some things for those who believe in and on Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, it's, it's wonderful what God has done. It's wonderful what God has prepared. Uh, but predestination sometimes gets caught up in, in other doctrines that really um, say the opposite. And the question being, as we started out, was does God choose us or do we choose God? And, you know, there are some who believe that, uh, you know, God chooses us and we really don't have a choice in it. That God predestined people to be saved and he predestined those the, to go to hell and that God already planned that before the foundation of the earth and so it's based on a thing called election and whether you realize it or not if you're called you're called and there's nothing you can do about it and and you can't avoid God's grace when it's revealed to you uh, but should you come to the understanding at some stage in your uh, in your life that you want to be saved if you're not the elect you can't be because you just haven't been predestined to it well that's not what it means that's not what predestination means. Uh, predestination means that God in his foreknowledge looked into a, a time and saw that there would be people who would accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior as he provided salvation through Jesus. And for those who would accept Jesus, he, he put together a pre-organized program for us to enjoy for us to be able, for us to be capable of fulfilling the role of the body of Christ or the church. And, uh, you know, salvation is not predetermined. Salvation is a choice. Man has been given freedom right from the very get-go, from the book of Genesis. He told Adam, eat freely of any of the trees of the garden. And right down in the book of Revelation, the Bible says, whosoever will come, let him come and drink freely from the water of life. So freedom is always something that man has, choice. Uh, and so God doesn't predetermine who's saved or predetermine who won't get saved. Does God know who will and who won't? Yes, he does. But does God predetermine their actions? No, he doesn't. However, God does predetermine uh, in a package a uh, provision for those who will make Jesus Lord of their life. And so we, we, we started to deal with that. Um, and the big crux for that is called Calvinism. Uh, also Arminianism, but um, uh, they teach that, you know, you have no choice in the matter, that God chooses you or rejects you. And that's not true. Um, and in order to do that, you've got to understand the character of God. And before we get into any doctrine, you've got to understand the character of God. And so God's character, uh, how you perceive God directly affects how you receive from God. How you uh, perceive God directly affects how you receive God. Um, and so that's, that's imperative that we understand and grasp that. So the nature of God reveals to us that God is a God of love. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, uh, God wants all men. Uh, or Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men onto me. And God is constantly telling people that he wants all men to be saved, all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, and so on and so forth. And so that's the nature of God. God is love. God, and, and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of his suffered wrong and so on and so forth. God is gracious. God is merciful. However, those who believe in the predestination or Calvinism believe that God picks you before uh, 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 you were ever born and there's nothing you can do about it. They use Romans 9, 10, and 11 as one of their fundamental um, uh, scriptural precedence for this, that God picks certain people and rejects others. So in order to do that, I, I thought we better go back and explain uh, what was happening at that time so you'll understand truly what that meant. Now we talked about, uh, uh, Calvinism says, uh, God is sovereign. And you know what? God is sovereign. God doesn't have to answer to anybody. He's sovereign. However, in God's sovereignty, he chose to extend grace towards us. God, God decided that. Uh, uh, with sovereignty, there's nothing you can do. With sovereignty, um, it, God, God just does what God does. And, but with grace, God offered grace to you in his sovereignty. So it's very important that you understand. Grace is a provision of God's sovereignty, but grace is not. See? Awesome. Thank you so much. The coffee's back there, guys. <laughs> 
Grace is not sovereignty. And grace can be accepted or rejected. And so our salvation is by faith in the grace of God, the provision of God. Calvinism, there is no gospel in Calvinism. Please understand this. There is no gospel in it. Because why would you preach a gospel? Because if you're predetermined, you're predetermined. And if you're not predetermined, you're not predetermined. And so there is no gospel in Calvinism. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's not there. Also, Calvinism would believe uh, that you are, um, you need to be uh, uh, regenerated before you exercise faith in, uh, or before, before you believe. Um, and so regeneration in Calvinism comes before belief. Uh, they say, that, you know, you were so um, out of step with God that you have to be regenerated before you can even have the sense to believe. So you've got to be regenerated before belief. That's totally opposite to what the gospel teaches. The, the gospel teaches us that we've got to believe. And in that believing, we are regenerated. And, and so, you know, it, it just... Um, and, and so I talked to you... Um, uh, what God does in grace must be received by faith. Um, and again, I'm trying to encapsulate everything here so that we all, all get in on it before we close it. Um, uh, so what, what, uh, uh, what God does in grace must be received by faith. So let me just give a summary of predestination as we close this thing out so that we won't forget it. Predestination really is based upon God knowing foreknowing for some things. You don't have to remember this. I just put it up here. We did this before. And basically, our salvation, which is forgiveness and adoption and all these different things, are offered to whosoever will. And if you choose, and should you choose, you fall into a position that the scriptures call either the called or the elect or the chosen or the church. And that results in being conformed to the image of Christ. That's really what happens in salvation. And so it's all based on God knowing in advance and providing uh, something for us. I use the illustration, many of us as men, you know, when our wives were pregnant, uh, we can actually sit uh, uh, while she's in her uh, pregnancy and start to make plans for the child that is not yet born. And we start to put money in a college fund. Uh, although they're not even 18, they're not even born yet, we start to make provision, we start to make plans, we start to put it away, we start to predetermine some things for them. And we put money in a savings account and the child is born and the child grows up and becomes 18 years of age and this, you know, provision has been predestined for them to go to college. And so when they come along at 18 and say, listen, Dad, uh, I want the money to go to college, you say, hey, I've already made a plan for you for that. And so pick your college and we've got it all sorted out. We predetermined, pre-organized, pre-planned your education at this stage. And I'm glad you chose that. And there's the provision for you. But I also made the statement that should that 18-year-old come along and say, you know what, I believe you have money set aside and I want to buy stuff, I want to buy do drugs or I want to do whatever. And I, and I know you have money set aside for me. The answer is no. I didn't predetermine, pre-plan, pre-organize that for that reason. I predetermined, pre-organized, predestined that resource for you to accomplish and achieve something. And that's really what predestination is. When we arrive at that place, should we choose Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we are, are, have access to a package. We have access to the provision of God, to an abundance that God has provided for us through his grace. He didn't have to do it. We didn't earn it. We didn't merit it. God provided it. So um, we started to talk uh, uh, about Romans 8, 9, and 10. And we're going to actually turn to it this morning in, in just a moment. We started to talk to it to us because uh, chapter 8, the end of chapter 8, uh, Paul is talking in the book of Romans about nothing can separate us from the love of God. And at the end of chapter 8, um, end of chapter 8 should actually start up again. The thought starts up again in, in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, uh, we should present our, uh, ourselves uh, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Therefore, present yourself. So at the end of chapter 8, it says, nothing separates us from the love of God. Therefore, chapter 12, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's the train of thought. However, 
Paul deviates over to the side for a moment and he starts to talk about something in chapters 8, 9, sorry, 9, 10, and 11 that seem out of sequence. Uh, but they actually, if you understand what he's doing, you can understand what, he, what he's getting at. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 seem to uh, be sort of a, 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 a rabbit hole that Paul has gone down. And he went down that particular rabbit hole for a reason. Paul is writing to the church in Rome and it's made up of Jews and Gentiles. And the thing about it is Paul in his discourse in the book of Romans spends time trying to explain, you know what, in chapter one, everybody's degenerate. All, all uh, Gentiles, you know, we, we became depraved in our thinking and they went a certain direction. In chapter two, he says, oh, by the way, you religious people, you are just as lost as the, the, the Gentiles are. You may have had certain things given to you, but you know what? Uh, you can, in your religion, still miss God. In chapter three, he says the truth of the matter is we're all sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. In chapter four, he started to explain, you know what? It all works based on a principle called faith, truly for everybody, Gentile and Jew alike. In chapter five, he starts to explain that how Jesus came in to make that uh, possible, how that we could have faith in, in a mediator as opposed to all being born under Adam, we could all escape out of that now by believing in Jesus Christ. Paul in chapter six then starts to explain what that means, being dead, buried, and resurrected in Christ. And we're no longer under sin, but now we can live a life of righteousness. In chapter seven, he talked about how that, you know, he found difficulty changing over, transitioning into that new way of thinking. But in chapter eight, he comes to the conclusion, here's how you do it. You just walk in the spirit. You just listen to your newborn spirit and you start to live that way, win that battle in your mind, and you start to walk according to the purpose and plan that God has for your life. And you can mature in the things of God. And then he, he, he takes that actual thought up in chapter 12 where he says, therefore, present yourselves living sacrifices, holding and acceptable unto God. But at the end of chapter eight, Paul takes a side note. And that side note is for all the Jewish believers that are looking at this <clears throat> because they're bent out of shape. They're annoyed, they're concerned because, you know, God always used to flow through the, the Jews, always used to do everything through the Jews. They were the favored nation. They were the favored people. And now God's doing something completely different. God now has made a body made up of Jew and Gentile. And uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, and, and, and the Jews are bent out of shape. They're annoyed, they're worried. They're thinking, my goodness, why did God do that to us? And <clears throat> Paul in chapter nine, 10 and 11 explains why Israel as a nation are on the sideline and why God has raised up the church. And so that's what he talks about. Now, in order to explain those three chapters, I had to go back last week and deal with this. How in Leviticus, God told the children of Israel that if you don't buck up and if you don't stay in line, your nation will get away from God. And so we talked about if, if you won't hearken and if you will not listen to what I do, uh, your nation will go into hardness of heart and as a result of that you'll separate yourself from me and so we talked about that we talked about how that in the book of isaiah isaiah also at a time when israel were truly turning their heart away from god god raised up isaiah to go and speak to them and basically said hear indeed but understand not you see indeed but you perceive not Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And Isaiah warned them and said, here guys, you are on that slippy slope. You're, you're moving away from that favored nation status, not because of God, but because of your own hard heartedness, because you're dull of hearing. And when we get to the book of, or through the New Testament, on seven occasions, if you were to read your scriptures from Matthew uh, and, and just read through, you'll find in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and in Acts, this same quotation comes up in every one of these books because the writers are bringing attention to, the Spirit of God is using these writers to bring attention to the fact that the Jews have become hard-hearted. It's why they crucified the Christ. It's why their religion rejected their Savior because they were dull of hearing, because they were hard of heart. Exactly what Isaiah said would happen, exactly what God told them would happen in Leviticus chapter 26.
you have come to that place, you have come to that stage because in your religiosity, you thought you were the be all and end all and you stopped following God by faith. And it's always gonna be by faith. And as a result of your uh, religion, you have been sidelined so that God could do something with people who would walk with him in faith. So it's mentioned in Matthew, it's mentioned in Mark, it's mentioned in Luke, it's mentioned in John, it's actually mentioned here in the book of Romans, it's mentioned in the book of Second Corinthians, and it's mentioned in the book of First Thessalonians. The same, the, the same thought, if you become, you Jews become hard-hearted, as a result, you are temporarily sidelined. So Paul writes to them in the book of Romans about it. And basically, he's going to explain to them that it's always been by faith. Abraham, was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile when he started his walk with God? He was a Gentile. He was a Gentile. Uh, he came from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, he wasn't a Hebrew. He wasn't a an Israelite, he wasn't a Jew. The Israelites hadn't even showed up and, and the term Jews wasn't even given to him. Pardon? He was in Iraq. Yeah, that's exactly right. He was worshiping the moon over in Iraq. And we don't know if he was the first uh, I, or maybe one of many that God offered this covenant to, but he took up on it. And he took it up by faith. And Hebrews 11 tells us, by faith Abraham went where he didn't know where he was going just believe in God. And so the guy entered into a covenant in Romans chapter 4, and we dealt with this a few weeks ago. In Romans chapter 4, Paul went to great detail to explain, hey guys, you Jews, you thought you were in on it because of circumcision. Listen, circumcision was only an outward sign of this guy's faith. This guy had already entered into covenant with God by faith. You came about by faith. You became a nation by faith. And, and the fact that you're still here is because some of you, among you, kept running with God by faith. And you miss it. It's always been by faith. You thought, well, we're in because we're circumcised. We're in because we have the law. We're in because we had, you know, the glory of God. He goes, nah, that's not why you were in. You're always only in because of faith. And God did it that way so that not just Jews would get in, but Gentiles. If they exercised faith, they could get in too. And so we went through this. I brought this up too also in the last few weeks to help you understand something. I asked you what was this? It's a desert. And it's that way because the sun has dried it up. I asked you what was that? And we said it was crayons. And these crayons were melted by the same sun. So the sun hardens some things and it softens others. So do you blame the sun because one gets hard and one gets soft? No, it's their receptivity to the sun. And I talked about the grace of God and how that the grace of God, you know, melts people. They yield to what God is trying to do. But for others, they oppose it. They push against it because of choice and they become hardened to God. But do we blame God because some get hard? Do we blame God because some are soft? No, it's all down to the receptivity or how they respond to the sun. So it is with the grace of God. The grace of God, as God extends it to men, for some men, they get hardened. They push away from it. They don't want to hear it. It, it exposes them for who they are or what they are, and, and they don't want it. And the more God approaches them, the harder they got to get to... to not be affected by it. Or the Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They, they, they push it down. It's like taking that cork in a tub of water and in order to keep it at the bottom, you've got to keep it down by suppressing it. And so he says in Romans 1, people suppress the truth. They get hard to God. They have to keep it down because God's uh, uh, grace being extended toward them doesn't suit what they're choosing as a manner of life. And so some people become hard by the grace of God and some people become soft. Do we blame God for the hardness? No. Do we blame God for the softness? No. That's the choice and the receptivity of the individual to the grace of God. And so that's what we started to talk about. The children of Israel are, have become hard as a nation. And as a result of that, they've been sidelined. In their uh, being put to the sideline, God raised up the church. And so Paul is writing to the Jews here that are in Rome and saying, hey guys, you're, you're all bent out of shape because God's doing a new thing with these Gentiles and Jews. But you know what? It's, it's, uh, it's not God's fault. It's 
the hardness of the heart of Israel, and God sidelined them so he could do something new by raising up this new entity called the body of Christ. All still with me? All right, because I'm really summarizing it all up, trying to just pack it all into one. So, uh, I talked about exegesis and eisegesis last week, and I said, look at guys, here's the way it goes. If you come to God with, uh, uh, and study the word, that's exegesis, and you find out what the word is saying. But eisegesis is when you come to the word and you already have a preconceived idea and you try to get the word to fit it. That's what Calvinism does. It has this idea and then it comes to the scriptures trying to make the scriptures suit what they're saying. But Romans 9, 10, and 11 does not say that God favors some and rejects others. That's not what it says. We're going to read it now in a minute. Um, let me, let me go to the book of Romans. Let's do that. All right. Let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 9 if you have a Bible with you. And we'll, uh, we'll just address this. Uh, if you go to Romans chapter 8, and I'll just show you where the thought ends and where it takes up again. In Romans chapter 8, and it says in verse 39, it says, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature be able to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then that thought takes up again, I beseech you therefore to present your bodies as, a, a, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's the thought. But in chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul goes down a little rabbit hole here. And the reason he goes down this rabbit hole is to address his Jewish audience that are wondering why this ended up the way it did. Why God raised up the church. Is God finished with Israel? Is it all over? And he's saying, no, it's not all over. God still has a plan for Israel, but they have been sidelined for this purpose, and um, they will be used again. So in chapter 9, it starts off and it says, Paul, just in his rabbit trail, says, I say the truth in Christ, and I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren and kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are his brethren and who are his kinsmen? The Jews. And Paul's basically saying, you know, God, but guys, my heart's broken over what happened. And in fact, if I could change it, if I could step in and take your place, I'd have done it. But it's not the way it works. But he says, my heart's broke over what happened to you guys. Um, and again, he's going to talk here to the Jews. This is not about believers and unbelievers. This is about the Jewish nation and why they are now on, on uh, being sidetracked, so to speak, or, or, or temporarily blinded. He goes on to say, in verse 4, who are Israel? That's, that's what he's talking about. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And so he says, you know what? You Jews, you just really were a privileged crowd. You really were a special people. There's no doubt about that. You had privileges that were given to you that nobody else had. You had adoption. You, you had privileges that other people didn't have. You were the favored nation. You were God's people. God chose you to be. And of course, you were very privileged to have that. Also, you had the glory. You had the Shekinah glory. You had the pillar of fire at night. You had the pillar of cloud at day. You had the presence of God with you. Absolutely, you were a privileged bunch of people. You also had the covenants. They had four covenants that were given to them. The Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, they had the um, Davidic covenant, and they had the new covenant that was a millennial thing. He said, you had promises made to you as a nation that nobody else had. These are definitely God's favored people. There's no doubt about that. He goes on to say, eh, and the giving of the law. They had the law. God had given them eh, eh, ten commands. He'd given them eh, eh, standards to live by and, and to be governed by, eh, and that if they would obey it, they would have access to favor and grace that other nations wouldn't have. So th they had these privileges going for them. It says, and the service of God, which was the priesthood. These people could approach a living God. 
These people had access to the living God. These people had communion with the living God. And he says, guys, I, I love you guys. You really and are a, 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 a very, very privileged people. You've had all this adoption, glory, covenants, law, the service of God, and you also had the promises. You had the promises of the Messiah. You had a promise of a kingdom. You had all of these things going, as well as that, you had the patriarchs. You had Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of these great leaders and prophets. You have all of these people that God raised up to minister to you and through you. And yes, you were a privileged people. He says in verse 5, who are the fathers and of whom concerning the flesh? Christ. You know what? He says, and even your Messiah was, came through you as a nation. I mean, talk about favored people. You guys had it all. But here's where you went wrong. You thought because you were so privileged to have all of this that, you know, it was just a done deal. You just had to be born into it and grow up in it, and that was the way it worked. And he says, no, it has always been by faith. It has always, you are there because of faith. Your problem was you became so hard-hearted in all of your privilege that you went and you murdered or crucified your very own Savior. You didn't even see it. And so he goes on to talk about, in verse 6, um, let me go to verse 6, not as through the word of God hath taken not effect, for they are not all Israel which are Israel. Let me, let me explain, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Let me explain now what he's talking about. For the next several verses, he says, you know what? You are Israel, but not all Israel is Israel. Most of you are hard-hearted, but some of you are still a remnant that believe by faith. And he starts to explain here in the next several verses how faith worked. It started with Abraham. Abraham got in with God by faith. Abraham then had a son called Isaac. And again, it was by faith. When he was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, God made them a promise. When they were past having children, God made them a promise. And they brought forth a son by faith. He says, and then after that, there was two sons born. One was Esau and the other was Jacob. And the thing about it was, in order for God's plan in faith to move forward, God chose Jacob over Esau. The reason he chose Jacob or preferred Jacob was because Jacob stayed in faith. Esau didn't want it. And God said, fine. It's not about birth. It's not about the privilege, it's about faith. That's why he chose Jacob. He chose Jacob because Jacob wanted it. He, he, he didn't reject Esau because Esau was a bad kid. He just rejected Esau because Esau um, didn't want it. And the other guy did. And God says, fine, we'll, we'll move by faith. And as God goes down this story, as he reads this story down, he says, you know what? Some people responded positively to what God was doing. Other people were hardened by it. And so he goes down here to say, um, let me go down to um, in verse, let me read verse um, 8. It's, no, I'll read verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He says, not all Israel is Israel. The real Israel are a people who are of faith, just like Abraham. And not all Abraham's children are really, so to speak, Abraham's children, because Abraham was the father of faith, and although Israel came forth, it was the faith line that God was dealing with all the time. He goes down then in chapter 9 and says, and this is the word of promise, at that time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And again, it was by faith. And so he brought forth Isaac. And not only this, but with Rebekah, also he had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. It says, for the children yet not being born, and having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not for works, but by him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And... The reason God chose uh, Jacob was because Jacob was in faith. Jacob wanted it, and Esau sold it for porridge. Do you remember that story? All with me? And, and then it, it just carries on talking about how that God, his grace always was extended, 
it, it was always by faith in the grace of God. And even when he extended it to uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh actually got hardened. In, in, in like, like the, um, the desert I showed you there. You know, sometimes God extends grace and people just turn against it. Go back with me to the book of um, uh, Exodus, if you would, for a minute. Exodus chapter 9. People say, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God didn't harden his heart. God kept extending grace toward him. And, and the more grace God offered him, the harder the man got. And God said, well, fine, I'll use it. He didn't harden his heart. He just used his hard heart to reveal his grace. Look in chapter 9 and verse 16. Will someone read that for me? Sorry, um, verse 15. He says, I've raised you up that I may show forth my power um, in all of the earth. Um, go back with me to chapter 8. And, sorry, go, go to chapter 7 and read verse 14, somebody, please. Yes, please. Okay, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses. Um, read, somebody read uh, uh, verse 20. Sorry, go to chapter 8 and read verse 15. Verse 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also, neither would he let the people go. Chapter 9 and verse 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Chapter 12, verse 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hardened his heart not unto them, uh, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder was ceased, he sent yet more, hardened his heart, he and his servants. Next verse. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go. Chapter 10 and verse 20. But the Lord was, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. Verse 27. I was just going to read one. <laughs> but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart would not let them go. And, uh, all right, I'll leave you there. The, the, what, what I want you to see is God kept offering a solution and he kept pushing back. God kept offering it, he kept pushing back. So people say, well, God hardened his heart. No, he, he responded to God with a, and his heart kept getting harder and harder. God didn't make him hard. God didn't raise up or give Pharaoh birth so that Pharaoh would be a hard-hearted individual so that God could do what he did. He didn't give Pharaoh light so that Pharaoh would be a hard-hearted in individual. However, every time God went to offer grace to him, he hardened his heart. And God said, I'll use you. Your attitude towards me, I'll just show you how gracious I can be. And so he kept offering, they kept refusing. He kept offering, they kept refusing. His heart kept getting harder, but it, it wasn't because God made his heart hard. It was Pharaoh's rejection of the grace that was being offered him by God. And this is what Paul's going to point out in chapter 9, 10, and 11 of Romans. 
God offers grace to people and they just don't, ref they refuse it. And when they do so, their heart gets hardened. That's why the Bible is going to say again and again, uh, when Paul is preaching the gospel, to the Jew first and then to who? Then to the Gentile. He offered it to the Jews first, but because of their hard heartedness, just like what happened to Pharaoh, he offered it and they, 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 they couldn't see it. They didn't see it. And as a result of that, um, they, they, God sidelined them and he gave it to the Gentiles. And that's what God was doing now. Let's go back to Romans, if you would. Because again, a lot of times people say, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Again, God didn't, he, he didn't technically harden it. He just used the circumstance that revealed a hard heart. It was, it was Pharaoh that was hardening his own heart. And so the Bible says here, um, in, in Romans chapter 9, um, if, if we read it through, and I'll, and I'll let you ask me any questions concerning it, more so than trying to explain it all. In Romans chapter 9, Paul explains uh, that Israel's problem was that they did not use faith. Look what it says here in um, verse 30. Somebody will read verse 30 and 31. Next verse. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Again, he's, you can read the next verse too. That's good. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Okay. He says here, what do we say then about these Gentiles who obtained this righteousness, but not the way that the, the Jews did? In verse 30, what do we say then? The Gentiles which followed not after the righteousness, but they obtained the righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, which follow after the law of righteousness, didn't get it, didn't attain to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith. They didn't walk with God by faith, and that was their problem. They were trying to live it through their privilege status, through circumcision, through their religion, and it was always by faith. That's why the Gentiles got in on it. They got in on it by faith. In verse, chapter 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He says, I want the whole nation to come. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, this is what he's saying, they're ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. He says, you know what? I bear them witness. They're a zealous people. They're a good people. They, 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 they love God, but their problem is that they love their religion. They're leaning toward their works. They're leaning toward their privilege more so than walking with God by faith. And they're trying to obtain righteousness by works. And it's not by works, it's righteousness by faith. That's why the Gentiles got in. God offered it to the Gentiles and they took it. And, and the reason he did was because God always had a faith program. He always offered grace and that grace is always responded to by faith. Some hardened their heart toward it, some accepted it. You hardened your heart, and God offered it to the Gentiles, and they took it. And he says, that's why they're in, and that's why you as a nation are sidelined. And then he goes on to talk about these verses that we're always familiar with. We always use it in, in, in verse uh, 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in your heart, who shall ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto Salvation. How many of you have heard that, stuff, that quote? You see, we quote it all the time. And Paul was using that to explain to the Jews, you know what, guys? You, you, you're sidelined, 
and, and, and because of your hard-heartedness. That was the only reason. And he used all these different examples of Esau and Pharaoh and different ones that even though God was extending grace, they just, they refused it. And he said, now, you went about trying to obtain righteousness by the law and you've missed it. It was always by faith. And so here's how it works. If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, if you exercise faith, you get saved. As a nation, you're on the sideline right now. As an individual, any one of you can come to Christ by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. But as a nation, that's the reason you are on the sideline. Um, all chapter 10 deals with that. Um, look with me in chapter 11, please, if someone would go there and read um, verse... Uh, six. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. He basically says, you know what, guys? All of this is always by grace. It has always been by grace. You know why God left it by grace? You know why God put it out there as an offer? Because that offer can only be received by faith. And anybody can exercise faith. Abraham did it when he wasn't even a, when, when he wasn't even a, 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 a Jew. It's by faith. That's why Abraham got in. That's why the Gentiles can jump in now. You say, well, Abraham was our father. Yeah, but he was a Gentile when he got saved. He exercised faith. It's always been faith. It's been faith with Isaac. It's been faith, faith with Jacob. It's been faith with Israel. It's been faith with the remnant that come out of Israel. It's always been faith. And you guys just have missed it, so you're sidelined for now. Uh, look over with me in, um, go with me to verse, uh, I wanted to find the um, because of. Uh, look at me in verse 20. Will somebody read that? Okay, and he's talking to the people who are in. He says, you know what? Because of their unbelief, they were sidelined. Because of their unbelief, they were broken off for what God was doing. Um, and that's the reason they are there. Verse 23. Somebody read that. Will you read verse um, 25? Okay, uh, let, me, let me just wind this down. I'll open it for questions because we've got some time. All he's saying in chapter 9, 10, and 11, and I haven't gone into detail. As you can see, it's, there's a lot to explain. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, it's a, par a parenthetical um, portion of, of Romans where Paul takes a sideline, having the gospel is for everybody, Jew and Gentile, but hey, you Gent Jews, Here's the reason you're sidelined. Here's the reason Israel are not front and center of what God is doing. Here's the reason the church are front and center. Your hard-heartedness. You've just got hard. You've just got um, out of faith. And, and it's always been by faith. And so you're on the sideline until the return of the Messiah. When he returns at the second advent, you'll all turn your hearts toward him as a nation. But until then, it's now down to it, this individual thing that God is doing, offering grace to whosoever will believe. It has always been by faith. It will always be by faith. And that's the reason the children of Israel are, are, are sidelined because of their hard heart. Now, people in Calvinism grab these three chapters and they say, here you are, God chooses certain people not to be saved, certain people to be saved. Certain people like he didn't choose a uh, uh, Esau, but he chose Jacob. He didn't choose Moses or Pharaoh, but he chose Moses. And he raised up different people for, God didn't do that. God just, as he ran through history, offered grace. Some people hardened their hearts, some people didn't. And he just makes a record here for the children of Israel of people that they would have said hardened their heart, and then they didn't realize they hardened their heart themselves. Yeah, they understood that um, Esau didn't do it by faith. Yeah, they understood that Pharaoh hardened his heart, but what they failed to realize was over time, they hardened their hearts too to the very same grace that God was offering them.
And that's why they seem to be on the sideline for now, and the Gentiles and the church have risen up in their stead. When the church are extracted, we go back to Israel, but that's the, that's the, um, the reasoning that he gives them in chapters 9, 10, and 11. It is not that God predetermined some people to be saved and some people not to be saved. God always determined it was by grace that it might be by faith. I'm sorry for trying to pack all of that into that. I did a terrible job of it. Nonetheless, um, I wanted to show you this. Did I, did I give this to you guys, the 60 things? Did I, always, did I give that to you guys here? We already have that. That happened to you when you get born again. All right. Now, does anybody want to ask any questions on predestination? And I, I, I felt I didn't do a good job of that because of, there's so much in it. I tried to recap too much. Anyway, anybody want to ask me any questions about predestination? Please feel free. Yes, sir. So, if I look at it, like, I think the biggest, for me personally, um, argument against Calvinism seems to go against the nature of God, right? The grace and mercy. What, what do they do with those verses where it says, you know, I, I wish that all would come to faith? This is the difference between a an exegesis and an eisegesis. I told you exegesis is when you go to the scriptures, you read the scriptures, and you try to find out what they're saying to us. Eisegesis is when you go to the scriptures, but you already have your preconceived idea. And then you shop around for verses that, that back up what you are thinking. And so Calvinism jumps in and says, uh, because of stuff like God raised up Pharaoh and hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, see, God did that to Pharaoh, and, and God did this, and, and obviously um, God chooses certain people to be saved and certain people not to be saved. And, and so they find verses like this and say, that proves our point. But it doesn't, as I said. Before you start concluding any doctrine, you need to go and find out the nature of God. And so they, they can't explain it. Uh, to be honest with you, they can't. And they use several other verses as well um, to uh, talk about uh, people being predestined to be saved and some being predestined to go to hell. And there's many of them that they use, but they're out of context. They're, so this is one that they grab and it, it's out of context. That is not what Paul is not talking to the Gentiles here at all. He's talking directly to the Jewish nation saying, you're sidelined because of your hard heart, period. That's all. That's why. And he's just explaining it to them because he loves them. He's trying to explain what happened to them. And, and that's all. But Calvinism jumps in and, and uses this saying, God hardens some, chooses some, and rejects others. That's not what Paul said here. But, but they have to twist scriptures to make the character of God different than what the scriptures say. So um, it's a bad doctrine. And, and the reason I addressed it, and the reason I, actually the reason I got into it more was we, we had some people uh, that, that had showed up and they pushed back on it right from the get-go. And I thought they were gonna be here every week, so I thought I'd deal with it, but it didn't happen. So I got deeper into something that I didn't really wanna get deep into because it is a doctrine. And uh, as much and all as I wanna deal with some of these concepts, uh, it's not a, we're not a Bible school and I didn't really want to delve into stuff. That's why I'm finding it very difficult to get through 9, 10, 11 without explaining the whole thing to you. I'm so sorry, I don't want to get out of it um, because it's doctrine. Well, Anybody else got a question? Uh, no, I'm, I'm glad you did this because uh, you really brought the emphasis out of Abraham's faith. I don't know if that really brought out in Sunday school or, or yeah. sermons. Or whatever. Did, does that make sense to you, 9, 10, and 11, by the way? It does make sense. If you read chapters 9, 10, and 11, it'll make perfect sense to you now when you realize what Paul is trying to say to the Jewish nation as to why they're on the sideline. They just didn't exercise faith. But they'll come back in at a later, a later stage. But now God's using Gentiles and the church, but the church is made up of Jew and Gentile. Anybody else got a question on it? Please feel free. 
And a lot of times when people read the book of Romans, it, it just seems like, what is that all about? You know, everything's going great, it's explaining, it makes sense, makes sense. And then all of a sudden he goes into 9, 10, and 11, and it looks like, what exactly is he saying there? Well, it's just a side note, it's a rabbit hole that he's just gone down to help uh, people understand. Yes, Doug? exactly what happens to Calvinists and there's a lot of churches in this area believe that yes sir and there's a lot of church uh, yeah I don't want to mention his name because I'm ugly Yeah, and I, I, you know, it, it, it's a bad doctrine. It just is, and it, it causes people to sit back on their laurels of thinking, I'm, I'm elect. In fact, the elect don't even know they're elect. That's the truth. They still don't even, they're not even sure. Um, they're not absolutely sure. They say if you are elect, you can be sure, but they're not sure they're elect. It's well, a bad. I think it's worse than that. I think it runs people off who aren't believers because they think of the exclusivity. Chosen, I guess I wasn't. So exactly. Or, uh, as I say it this way, um, the Calvinists convert believers. Christians convert the lost. Calvinists don't go after the lost. They actually try to convert other believers to their way of thinking. So that's really what they do. They spend most of their time uh, among groups like this trying to explain predestination. That's what they've tried to do. So they spend most of their time trying to convert Christians to their way of thinking, but Christians spend their time trying to convert the lost. How, how, how does faith and grace fit into Calvinism? There, it, it doesn't. Um, no, it doesn't. That's what I say. There is no gospel in Calvinism in that um, the gospel is you've got to put faith in what God has offered us in grace through Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. As a nation, they're hard. And as individuals, any individual can come to Christ. But as a nation, they're sidelined. But, but any Jew can make Jesus Lord of their life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 They are. It's, it's, just a, it's just a bad doctrine. And, and as I said, the reason I delved into it for 11 weeks was I thought we were going to have some more pushback here, and I just thought I'd at least start to address it. Now I wanted to get out of it, so I just sort of packed it all into this morning to say, look, here's 9, 10, 11. That's the way it works. I need to get out of this because it's taken up too much time, and there's not enough people here that are pushing back that need to fully understand it. Just here's how it works. Here's what happened. When you read it, you'll see it. Yes, sir. Charles Finney, uh, in his meetings, had what was known as the anxious bench, where people that were anxious about their salvation, and he invited someone to come and sit on the anxious bench, and the man said, oh, I, it doesn't matter, I'm not elect. <laughs> and Finney said, really? Have you ever, ever uh, checked it out? And the man finally talked to him a little while, he came up and said, he got saved, and Finney says to him, gee, I guess you were elect after all. Yeah. <laughs> you see, this is, this is the way it goes. It's, it's just not a good doctrine. I want you to know that it's always by faith. Everything we do with God, and the grace of God, is always received by faith. And, and, and that's the way it works. Um, and so predestination is God. It's not this stuff of, you know, you're saved and you're, not, you're chosen to be saved. It's, not, it's God has a plan. Um, I don't know if any of you ever got that list. Anybody, did all of you get that list? <laughs> 
And he, I think you gave it out on Saturday. I give it out on a Saturday, but I didn't give it to the men's group. And um, when people say predestined, predestined to what? Here are 60 things that happen to you instantaneously and or progressively from that moment on that happen to you when you give your life to Christ. All right? When you give your life to Christ, here's what, some of it is instantaneous and the rest of it, although it's given to you, it's progressively developed and worked out. And so I printed it out for you guys, for those of you who didn't see it. So you say, well, what were we predestined to? This. That's, just want to pass him back. Whoever wants one, please take him. Um, that's what you're predestined to. You say, well, what's predestination? What's in the package? That's what's in the package. That's what you got. Um, anybody got any other questions? Yes. Fundamentals in the Presbyterian Church, um, but also um, there's a lot of churches. In, like, for example, Southern ba Baptist churches are very gracious people, loving people, um, love God, love His Word, and unfortunately, one of the the weaknesses, I suppose, of Southern Baptist, in a sense, is that. Um, they want to believe God. They want to believe the Word. And Calvinism is such an indoctrination of... Uh, they, 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 you, you have very well schooled uh, in, in, in Calvinism because they spend, and most of their time is spent around Calvinistic doctrine uh, because what's the point of going into anything else? You're either in or you're out. And if you're out, you're out. And if you're in, you're in. And so they don't really major in a lot of the stuff. And so a lot of Southern Baptist churches, uh, you get people who rise up within it and, and become very detailed in the scriptures and confuse a lot of good people who really want to be open to the word but aren't as prepared in the word as some of these people are. And, and it, it, it hurts a lot of churches. A lot of good churches get hurt by this doctrine.